Dear Jean-Claude, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this year's ESM conference. I'm very honored to have Jean-Claude Trichet with us today. And this is for a number of reasons. I have known Jean-Claude for at least 25 years. And I have always been impressed by his vision, hard work, and style. We met many times in the 90s. I was a junior official in the German Ministry of Finance. Um, and we met in the German um, French Financial Council, G7 deputies meetings, um, ECOFIN councils, were, where in the 90s monetary union was prepared. And I remember one particular event in the early 90s when I accompanied the German Sherpa, Horst Köhler at the time, to one of these Sherpa meetings that always um, go through the weekend, and we had to prepare the next G7 summit in Germany. You will not remember this, Jean-Claude, but I remember very vividly, it was very late on a Friday night during the Sherpa dinner, and the question came up, and nobody had the answer at that point in time. So Jean-Claude said, I will have the answer tomorrow morning. This was Friday night around 10. Sure enough, at breakfast, the next morning, it was a Saturday, you had the answer. At that moment, um, two things happened to me. One, I began to really admire the efficiency and the hard work of the French administration, in particular the French Tresor, because I knew at the German Ministry of Finance at that point in time we would not have delivered the answer overnight. And therefore my second conclusion was that I would try whenever I had a chance later in life to make the German Ministry as efficient but also other institutions where I would work so my ESM colleagues still suffer under that until today. Um, Jean-Claude was the head of the French Treasury, the Tresor, until 1993 when he became the governor of the Banque de France. And this was a very special moment for the Banque de France because it became independent. Um, independent in setting interest rates and conducting monetary policy. So it was the right moment to move. Um, and Jean-Claude in that position became the architect of the so-called Franc 4 policy, which was key for price convergence and thus for the beginning of monetary union. After 10 years as governor of the Banque de France, he became the second ECB president in 2003. During the early part of that period, which was often called great moderation, which seems like a bad joke today with hindsight. He was one of the very few who continuously warned about growing imbalances within monetary union. I remember very clearly how he distributed at I think every meeting of the Eurogroup um, tables that showed the increase in wages and salaries in each member state of the Euro area since 1999. And looking back, Jean-Claude's table predicted it all. Guess which was the country with the highest increase in wages and salaries since 1999? Greece. The second, Ireland. The third, Portugal. And the fourth, Spain. We should have listened better than to you, Jean-Claude, but I promise we will listen very carefully to what you have to, you to say today in a moment. As ECB president, um, you also had to deal then with the global financial crisis from 2007 onward. And the ECB was actually the first central bank to react to the global financial crisis already in 2007. And then you had to deal with the beginning of the Euro crisis. And during that period, of course, you were intimately involved in the 
preparation and the creation of the EFSF. And when the EFSF became operational um, in June 2010 and I was appointed as the CEO, I traveled to Frankfurt almost immediately to discuss with you and your colleagues the most urgent tasks ahead of the EFSF. We met many times during that early part of the crisis and always had productive discussions on sometimes very difficult issues. Since Jean-Claude Trichet left the ECB in late 2011, 2011, yeah, he has continued to express his views about European integration, the unfinished business of EMU, and governance of the Euro area. I think we are all fortunate and eager to listen to you today, Jean-Claude, and to hear your views on economic, fiscal, and financial governance of the Euro area. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Klaus, uh, for your invitation. As you said, uh, we are old friends and uh, we accompanied uh, the European construction, I would say, from the beginning of our uh, discussions, uh, particularly between uh, uh, Germany and France, but with all our other colleagues uh, at the moment where we were uh, negotiating the uh, treaty. And uh, uh, then we had uh, to uh, accompany the extraordinary historical endeavor which uh, goes on and has, but I will go back to that, has proved a resilience which has been absolutely remarkable in the worst crisis ever since World War II. So again, thank you, Klaus. I have the vivid memory of all our encounters in Germany, in France, in the rest of the world, in uh, Washington also very often, uh, and in Frankfurt uh, very much at the moment where you were appointed head of this extraordinary new tool that was created. And uh, I, I hope that I could help you as much as possible, perhaps not always as you would have expected the ECB to do, but. Uh, anyway, I think uh, we try to be uh, as uh, helpful again as uh, we could. And all that being said, again, I think that the credibility of the ESM is absolutely remarkable. I can check it everywhere in the world. And I think it's one of the most, uh, I would say, impressive success of the European to be able, at the heat of the crisis, to launch a new treaty, negotiate and sign a new treaty at a time where the common wisdom was a treaty is impossible, we cannot embark in such a bold new adventure, but we had it, we negotiated it, we ratified it, and it was back on its feet uh, legally, if I'm not misled, in 12. And, uh, and again, the signature of the ESM is I would say, under your control, one of the best in the world. So, bravo, if I may. And again, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Let me uh, tell you that to understand the situation in which we are in Europe and the situation where are all the uh, advanced economy at the moment I'm speaking, we have to realize that since uh, 2007, 2008, we went through the worst crisis, the worst financial crisis ever since World War II. We cannot understand what the various central banks are doing and the debate in all our advanced economies if we don't realize that uh, we are still in the shadow of this absolutely dramatic financial crisis. We avoided to be back to a great depression, which would have been, in my opinion, worse or at least as grave as the depression in 2930s in the 20th century. We avoided that drama.
because we avoided that drama, we have a tendency to underestimate the gravity of the situation where we were in, uh, uh, say, 08, after the Lehman Brothers collapse. Had central banks of all big advanced economy, all advanced economy, not having had the capacity to be extremely bold and extremely swift in their decision, and had the governments and the parliaments in many cases of the advanced economy had not had the possibility to be themselves a little bit later on, very bold and very swift, we would have had the very cruel experience of having a great depression in the advanced economy. This is my strong belief. We avoided that great depression, so we have the sentiment that after all, it was only an episode in the cycle, in the cycle that was particularly acute, that we had a great recession. But the Great Recession does not represent the gravity of the situation which I would say crystallized in 07, 08. And again, to understand what is happening now, we have to take account of the gravity of that situation. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to understand the degree of accommodation and the degree of non-conventional measures that uh, are still taken by the central banks of the advanced economy eight, nine years after the start of the crisis. I would propose to you a reading of this uh, financial crisis in three episodes. I am oversimplifying, but I think it's a good way of trying to understand what happened. In 07, and more particularly in August 07, we had the start of the acute episode of the first uh, episode of this uh, financial crisis, which I would call financial turbulences, or generalized financial turbulences. Klaus, a moment ago, mentioned the fact that the ECB was indeed the 9th of August 2007, the first central bank to embark on unconventional measures because we had no normal functioning of our money market the 9th of August 2007. We decided to give liquidity on an unlimited basis, provided, of course, the various commercial banks would have the collateral to guarantee the uh, supply of liquidity by the central bank. It was the first, uh, I would say, decision to have uh, concept of full allotment at fixed rate. We were asked 95 billion euros, we delivered 95 billion euros, and again, uh, in terms of um, action of central banks, this was the start of this first episode of the crisis. It came, as Klaus uh, just mentioned, after a false period of tranquility, of uh, benign neglect, which was called the Great Moderation Period. We thought very naively that we have solved the problem of the volatility of both output and uh, inflation, and we were in a period with, uh, uh, I would say, reasonable growth uh, without too much volatility and uh, inflation that was uh, under control without too much volatility. But we were letting a large number of uh, factors paving the way for a dramatic crisis. I will have no time to go through all those factors that uh, were uh, you know, part of this uh, uh, dramatic environment, which were, was uh, not visible in the eyes of many, but uh, clearly over-indebtedness was part of these uh, multiple dimensions. So, first episode of the crisis, financial turbulences or generalized financial turbulences starting, say, to simplify August 2007 and uh, terminating uh, for this episode the 15th of September 2008. Collapse, bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. 
epicenter of the crisis, United States of America, we were in the subprime crisis. A number of observers were interpreting this situation as a period for reassessing risks in the global financial economy, reassessing uh, the volume of risks, the price of risk, and uh, after all, a uh, good uh, deal of the uh, overall, um, I would say, economists and observers and actors and market participants were thinking it's a good thing we, we were under assessing the uh, financial risks in the global economy and particularly in the advanced economies and now we are reassessing, re-estimating these risks uh, and this goes in the right direction. It's a correction which was necessary. Then starts uh, the second episode of the crisis which uh, I will call the grave and immediate threat of full collapse of the financial system of the advanced economies. Lehman Brothers uh, enter in bankruptcy the Monday, it's announced on Monday, 15 September 2008. And as a matter of half days, the uh, behavior of all financial institutions in the advanced economy by way of consequence of all non-financial institutions is changing. Uh, it appears that any counterparty uh, is uh, to be doubted in the circumstances. If Lehman Brothers can go bankrupt, any institution can go bankrupt. And uh, we observed this uh, kind of uh, extraordinarily uh, dramatic immediate contagion that, uh, to my knowledge, we were observing for the first time. Compared with what happened in 2930s, uh, what took place uh, as a matter of month or quarters was taking place as a matter of half days. And to give you an example of the drama of the situation, when the uh, United States Treasury was still saying that after all in a market economy it was absolutely normal that bankruptcy would, would take place. Uh, the Soviet Union was an economy where you had no bankruptcies and uh, clearly uh, it failed totally. Uh, the market economies where economies where bad management and uh, very bad behavior in the past was punished. So nothing to be said uh, on uh, Lehman Brothers, but uh, it was a poorly managed institution and it's absolutely normal that they fail. That was the rhetoric on the first day, the second day, and the third day, the three first day after the crisis. But as far as central banks were concerned, and of course the Federal Reserve, which was uh, at the first place of observation and action, it was clear that we were in a situation where the entire uh, financial world was starting to collapse. And we started immediately amongst the, the big uh, central banks uh, in the world, in the advanced economy, to discuss, to see what we could do in those exceptionally grave circumstances, totally dramatic circumstances, to give you an idea of what I was uh, meaning when I said bold and swift decisions. We were able in three day, two days and a half to negotiate uh, the activation of a network of swap agreement to have the decisions taken by the Fed and by all the other central banks concerned through the appropriate decision-making processes, meaning a Council of Governor meeting, in our case, uh, uh, Open Market Committee meeting, in the case of the United States, and the same in Japan, the same in London, the same in Switzerland, the same in Sweden, uh, and, we, and in Canada. And we had uh, the capacity to produce the Thursday, the next Thursday, um, the world over, in all the capital concerned, the same wording for the same decision taking, taken simultaneously 
by the uh, central banks I just mentioned. So you have an idea of the rapidity of the reaction, which was commensurate with the extraordinary dramatic rapidity of the contagion. Then the story goes on. We had a great recession in the last quarter of 2008 and in the two first quarters of 2009 in the advanced economies. Uh, the uh, Great Depression was avoided, the Great Recession was there, and at the end of the first semester of 2009, one could say, okay, it's been a very, very dramatic event. It's a, it was a close call to avoid an absolute drama, but after all, we had only one bankruptcy, Lehman Brothers, there was no other bankruptcies in the advanced economy, and now we have to pave the way for making uh, the financial world much more resilient, to understand fully what has happened, why we were so uh, neglecting a dramatic situation which was uh, piling up, uh, what was exactly the cause of our own benign neglect, and of course, uh, we have to uh, reinforce uh, prudentials, uh, in all the financial sectors, and we have also, of course, to permit the recovery to take place as well as possible. That was, you know, the situation of uh, the, I would say, global understanding of where we were at the end of 2009. And then we had the start of the third episode of the global financial crisis concentrating on the advanced economy. Third episode, the morphing of the financial crisis from a private signature financial crisis into a public signature financial crisis. I would continue to say this is still, and this was still, a global crisis of the advanced economy. Why do I say that even if it was located in Europe and more precisely in the Euro area. I say that because I could see a lot of small facts or big facts that were illustrating the fact that the investors and savers the world over were putting into question public signature after private signature. The literature on the signature of Japan was much more I would say severe. The literature on even the treasuries in the United States was much more aggressive. I could see some uh, uh, downgrading by rating agencies of the treasuries themselves in the United States. And more generally, investors, savers were uh, affirming that uh, they were not giving any ex ante privilege to any signature, that all signature had to demonstrate their own capacity to be credit worthy on the basis of facts and figures. That, of course, did not prevent the Euro area to be the new epicenter of the financial crisis. If I would propose to you some kind of simplified reading of what happened at that moment, I would say at the very beginning of the financial private crisis, you had a sequence, for instance, I'm again simplifying, Burr Stern, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, Lehman Brothers, and say AIG. You remember? It was the order of the difficulty appearing in the eyes of a global investor and saver. Burr Stern was saved with a combination of uh, help by the uh, authorities in the US and by a private rescue. Uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae were rescued by the public sector in the United States, more or less immediately after the problem of Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers was not rescued. And we had the start of what I called the grave and immediate threat of collapse of the system. And then we had AIG, which was rescued. So you have 
you know, a sequence of this uh, uh, signature. In Europe, the equivalent, namely the uh, uh, rank of signature, public uh, signature in that case, that were from the most vulnerable to the less vulnerable, and I take exactly what uh, Klaus was mentioning, most vulnerable Greece, then Ireland, then Portugal, then Spain, you name it, equivalent of what we had on the other side of the Atlantic. In both cases, it's a sequence of signatures that are deemed vulnerable in the eyes of the investors and savers. In both cases, it's a system which is at stake, not only one signature, but a, but a full system. And in both cases, you have to take, of course, both, I would say, the uh, fact that it is an institution or country succession of cases and also that it is within a system that, uh, which is losing credibility that it ha happens. So, epicenter of the crisis crosses the Atlantic at the end of 2009, beginning 2010. Paradox of the Euro area. You had at the same time in the Euro area the worst signature in the advanced economy. I already mentioned the judgment at the time of the investors and savers and the best signature of the advanced economy. And I would uh, dare say that at the same time the signature of Germany or the signature of the Netherlands, uh, not to quote uh, other signature of Austria, were considered amongst the best in the world, if not better than the other advanced economies. So you see the euro area stretched between the worst signature and the best signature, which uh, is the paradox of the euro area, which explains partially why the euro as a currency has been very solid in a period which was absolutely dramatic and in a period where the epicenter of the crisis was located precisely in the euro area. It is because of this uh, uh, characteristic of the euro area stretching and stretched between uh, the, the best and uh, the least um, credible or creditworthy. Now, the, the real question is, why is it that when the crisis morphed from a financial private sector crisis in a public sector crisis, the epicenter crossed the Atlantic to be located in the euro area, when paradoxically the euro area as a whole was in a situation which on a consolidated basis was probably better than many and the situation of many other advanced economies, including US, Japan, UK. I will propose to you six reasons why, in my own understanding, we presented clumsily the worst signature in the advanced economy. And I will uh, list the uh, causes, the main reasons, uh, in my own understanding, and of course, uh, consider that uh, these are titles of chapter uh, for the questions, question and answer session. First, we did not respect the Stability and Growth Pact. And that uh, is uh, something which is very, very important. When we created the Euro, we correctly said, and uh, the negotiator said, and uh, we <laughs> discussed that uh, with between Klaus and, and myself, we need a framework, a fiscal framework, because we are very bold, we are creating a single currency, and we do not have a political federation, we do not have a federal budget. So we have to be sure that uh, the I would say fiscal policies are within reasonable bound inside the euro area to be sure again that we are not creating 
uh, absence of uh, appropriate cohesion in the euro area. Very unfortunately, in 2003-2004, the major countries in Europe, under the presidency of Italy, uh, France and Germany, Germany and France, decided that the uh, Stability and Growth Pact would not apply in all its rigor to them. And uh, we had a very dramatic episode. I was just appointed myself president of the ECB, and I remember the first speech I delivered in the European Parliament was to call for strict respect of the Stability and Growth Pact as the quid pro quo for having a single currency without having a federal budget and a, a political federation. But unfortunately, uh, the uh, uh, big countries refused, again, the implementation of the pact for them. We had a trial. It was very dramatic. The Commission and the ECB protested vehemently. The uh, Court of Justice had to choose <laughs> between the two theses, and it was a, very much of a Solomon judgment, I would say. Uh, so finally, we could uh, maintain uh, the existence, of course, of the Stability and Growth Pact, maintain, in some respect, the letter of the pact, but the spirit of the pact had been very, very uh, gravely demolished. And uh, this is, for me, the first reason why we had uh, this uh, uh, very, I would say, clumsy situation starting uh, at the beginning of year 2010. Second reason, we had no monitoring of the overall competitiveness of the various uh, countries member of the euro area, no monitoring of the uh, uh, current account of the, uh, uh, I would say, surpluses or uh, deficits of the current account, so no measure of the relative competitive position by all indicators uh, that could be utilized. Uh, it was not uh, envisaged by the negotiators because they considered that a good functioning market economy should self-correct itself in case there would be loss of competitiveness, that the uh, social partners would consider that if there was a loss of competitiveness, they would pave the way for uh, appropriate uh, catching up of the uh, competitiveness that would have been lost. And uh, that, of course, the uh, policies of the countries themselves, of the nation themselves, would take care of that situation. It was a naive belief that market economy are always functioning correctly and are always self-correcting. In a way, it was a belief which was a little bit as naive as thinking that uh, financial markets are always right in the period of the great moderation. In the case of uh, Europe, as uh, Klaus also already mentioned, what we discovered, and I have to say that uh, it was in 2005 that the ECB uh, was convinced that the main problem we had, paradoxically, perhaps, in Europe as central bank was not to maintain price stability, which we had done, after all, quite correctly, not you know, extraordinarily well, I have to say, but very correctly in uh, comparison with our uh, benchmark, which was less than two, close to two. We were, indeed, close to two. Uh, but uh, what we could see was that the relative competitiveness of the various countries were diverging and that there were persistent divergences between the unit labor cost, uh, between the various, I would say, uh, nominal evolution of a series of indicators, wages and salaries in the public sector, uh, national inflation, uh, unit labor cost, in the various countries since the beginning of the euro, since January 99, so that we could see on our charts, and I was circulating those charts, 
every month to the ministers of finance of the Eurogroup, we could see that there was, since the beginning, divergences and no correction of those divergences in 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 4, 5. So each month, as I already said, there was the circulation of this evolution with the call, you are in a situation of persistent divergences and this is documented not only by various, uh, I would say, unique labor cost evolution, but also by what we are observing as regards the current accounts and the external accounts of the various countries. I have to say that as long as the financial markets were financing nicely those uh, divergences and those deficits in 05, 06, 07, 08, even 09, so even after the start of the financial crisis, the uh, necessity uh, of the correction uh, was not appearing clearly in the eyes of the various responsible uh, persons uh, involved. And uh, one can understand that in a way because, because again, uh, there was such uh, fluidity in the overall uh, markets, such easiness to finance these uh, deficits that it was difficult to, to realize that we were going in a wall. And um, again, th this is the second reason which I considered as grave as the first. And if I look at the various countries concerned, I would say clearly the main reason for the drama in the case of uh, uh, Greece and Portugal might be the absence of, uh, I would say, appropriate implementation of the stability and growth pact. The main reason for the problem which appeared uh, in uh, Spain and in Ireland, which, was which were coupled with real estate problems and financial problems, but the main reason was probably the uh, absence of correct follow-up of these uh, uh, divergences in terms of unit labor costs, divergences in terms of uh, loss of competitiveness, of course driven in both cases by a buoyant uh, domestic economy. Third reason I am here in the ESM and uh, I would say we had no tools uh, ex ante to cope with a dramatic crisis which was of a systemic nature and called for some kind of systemic response. And that, of course, uh, was uh, something which uh, was, cons uh, was considered by the external investors and savers as a particular weakness of the euro area. As I already mentioned, we proved the capacity to create several institutions and now crystallizing in the ESM, which has been created by a treaty. A treaty meant uh, going through the decision-making process in the various countries concerned in the euro area. So with all the, uh, I would say, difficulty and uh, of course the uh, legitimacy of uh, going through a democratic decision-making process, but it made, it made many decision-making process. If I'm not misled, you have 19 countries that have decided to be uh, in the ESM. And uh, in the US, if you had to create an exceptional tool to intervene in a dramatic situation, you had only one decision-making process, not 19. And uh, we could experience the TARP measure, for instance, which was taken very with great difficulty with a rejection of the proposal of the executive branch by the Congress as, as the, at the start, but then the, the executive branch came back demonstrating that it was absolutely necessary because the full, I would say, financial economy was falling down like a stone and the uh, Dow Jones was falling down like a stone and there was a positive uh, in the second reading, a positive decision. But one decision, one decision-making process, one uh, democracy uh, 
crystallizing in uh, the capital of the, federation, of the US Federation. In our case, again, many, many democracies involved and all the difficulties you can imagine. In, in a perspective, ex ante perspective, the probability of the European to really devise something which would hold, which would be solid, which would be unchallengeable uh, legally, was something which appeared very difficult. And uh, of course, we could start the thing with the EFSF and so forth, but uh, it was something which was considered by the uh, external observers as very, very difficult. And it was, again, part of the reason why we were not as a system, at least uh, in a system defending a number of its members, uh, credible. Then the, the last, uh, the, the fourth reason I would list is and was the fact that we had no banking union. And so the uh, sovereign bank nexus that uh, was created by the crisis and uh, introduced this element of high level of correlation between the creditworthiness of the countries and the creditworthiness of the banks for a number of reasons that was observed in all advanced economy, in the UK, in the US, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, Sweden or Switzerland. Namely, this, uh, the fact that if you are in a difficult situation, your banks are necessarily, because they have risks in your own country, uh, they are themselves in a difficult situation. And if you are in a good situation, if you have credit worthiness of uh, your own signature, uh, the signature of the, of the sovereign, and uh, a good country, if I may, that resist in the crisis, of course, it would reverberate on the banks in this country. That was one obvious reason why you have normally quite a high level of correlation between national banks and the nation, the economy of the nation itself. But on top of that, in the crisis, to the extent that all financial institutions were under the immediate threat of a collapse, of a full collapse, you had also the fact that the signature of the country was the ultimate backstop. When all heads of state and government in the advanced economy said, uh, I would say in various means, but they were giving some kind of, uh, I would say, full-fledged uh, political uh, guarantee uh, there will not be a new Lehman Brothers coming in my own country, and they all said that in various forms, as I said, then it meant the ultimate backstop for my banks are, is my signature. And of course, this introduced a new element reinforcing the correlation between the creditworthiness of the state and the creditworthiness of the banks. And that was an additional element stretching the euro area between the vicious circles of the countries having lost their, competi their sovereign competitiveness and having their banks with a very, very high level of correlation with the bad creditworthiness of the country and the virtuous circle of those who were exactly in the opposite situation with good creditworthiness of the sovereign signature and therefore relatively good uh, creditworthiness of the banks. So stretch, additional stretching. So we had no banking union. The two vicious and virtuous circles were functioning full speed and it was again, in my own understanding, a very important fourth reason why we were the epicenter of the crisis, of the sovereign risk. Now we have two other, because I mentioned six, you might remember, I see that some are taking, taking notes, so there are six, you should find the six reasons. And the two last ones are uh, not reasons that are specific uh, to the Euro area itself, as was the case for the four first reason, but the two last are uh, uh, reasons that uh, go to the full EU, the full European Union membership, it was the absence of full completion of the single market, 
which is, of course, an endeavor for the, all the members of the European Union, but particularly important, of course, for the euro area itself, because the euro area, having a single currency, needs a full functioning single market, uh, which would help, of course, all the adjustment to take place early and not very lately uh, in due course of the discovery of abnormal functioning of any segment of the single market. And the last reason uh, was the Lisbon agenda, the structural reform, the 2020, which also uh, are endeavors, uh, is an endeavor uh, that uh, deals with the full membership of the European Union, but is also particularly important for the euro area, uh, because again, uh, full functioning, uh, markets with the appropriate flexibility of uh, markets of goods, services, labor market, and so forth. And all what goes with the structural reforms is even more necessary when you have a market with a single currency. The paradox, as you, as you know, is that uh, very often, in particular cases, we can see more support for the completion of the single market and for the uh, implementation of the structural reforms in uh, the full membership of the EU than in the particular membership of the 19 countries that are in the euro area. I call that really a paradox because the euro area needs full completion of uh, the single market and full implementation of uh, these structural reforms. So you have the, your six reasons. Uh, in my understanding, uh, to say all this is the fault of the ECB is plain wrong. The ECB was there with a full-fledged mandate given by all our democracies to deliver price stability without inflation and without deflation. Uh, and it is what the ECB has done, obviously. Uh, when I compute uh, the stability over a relatively long period of time, we are below 2%, but close to 2% as a yearly average. Uh, the fear that we would have inflation has uh, vanished. And uh, when I look at all country, uh, currencies concerned, national currencies concerned, before the euro was set up, I would dare say, uh, even in front of German citizens, <laughs> that over 40 years, the average inflation for the DM, or the 40 years before the euro was set up, was significantly higher than the average inflation since uh, the euro is set up with the euro. So, and of course, uh, everybody is, uh, uh, I would say, uh, or can give testimony of the fight of the ECB against deflation or possible deflation in the present circumstances. And let's not forget that we were very clear that we wanted to avoid inflation and deflation, and the precision to avoid any ambiguity was given, you remember, in 2003 to say less than two, but close to two. Uh, again, to avoid any misunderstanding, but it was very well understood since the very beginning by the observers, the market participants, uh, and uh, all economists, because I remember since the very beginning of the euro, the inflation expectations were stabilized at the level of 1.8% or uh, 1.85. So in line, fully in line with this definition of price stability, less than two, but close to two. So uh, for the rest, uh, the ECB tried to do all what it could, and it was not in the treaty that the ECB had to tell the ministers of finance that there were persistent divergences. It was not in the treaty that the ECB had to call for full respect of the Stability and Growth Pact. But we considered that uh, being aware of a number of facts, 
figures, uh, evolutions uh, that were uh, uh, alarming, it was our duty to communicate, not substituting, of course, to governments, parliaments, uh, all institutions concerned, not substituting, of course, to the Commission or to the Council, but communicating uh, to the extent that uh, we had the capacity to see things from our own, uh, I would say, position of uh, action and observation, uh, communicating what we, we were uh, seeing. So, very rapidly, all the four first reasons for being at the epicenter of the crisis have been, have started to be corrected, say, because you, one cannot never say that it's over, and uh, I will uh, conclude on that. But we have reinforced considerably the Stability and Growth Pact, rightly so, with a new treaty to, to back the Stability and Growth Pact, with new procedures that are more demanding than the previous one, with the reversal of the burden of the proof, we have a new implementation of the Stability and Growth Pact, and I will call very, very strongly for the implementation of these new rules. We paid such a high price for not respecting the rules in the past that it would really be something very shocking if we would, in the present situation, not be fully aware of the necessity, again, in a single currency which is not a political federation and which has no federal budget to respect fully the uh, overall uh, framework. Second, we have now the MIP, the Macroeconomic Imbalance Procedure, which is the new pillar of governance which has been introduced in this uh, uh, dramatic situation to cope with the absence of sufficient lucidity as regard the possibility of competitiveness divergences. And from that standpoint, I have to say I was very satisfied that in the report of the five president, uh, the, there is a stress on the MIP which I consider very important. I already said MIP for me is as important as the SGP. These are the two pillars of governance in the hands of the Commission and of the uh, Council, which are, which are of extreme importance. Now, uh, we have the ESM, and I already paid homage to the ESM, uh, which is a, an instrument, a tool, which is credible, which is solid, and is part of uh, the overall, I would say, uh, solidity of uh, the system at the moment I'm speaking. I will not pronounce myself whether uh, you should have more capacity, even more capacity. Uh, it seems to me that uh, it might happen at times, but I hope very much that uh, we won't have to experience those times. And in any case, uh, there a decision has been taken, a treaty has been signed, as already said, and uh, the, the uh, issue has been treated. Now, we have the banking union. The banking union is... Uh, Structural reforms in the euro area, in Europe as a whole, which is of extreme importance, it is still work in progress, and uh, I uh, expect that uh, we will have uh, the finalization, and I would call for the finalization, of the uh, deposit insurance scheme, which is proposed by, by the Commission. We will see how things are, uh, are moving, but it seems to me that uh, uh, taking into account the lesson of the, of the crisis, we really need the uh, completion of the banking union and also of the capital market union. So all these are decisions that are very important uh, and of course are complementary because if you have only banking union and if you don't respect the MIP and the SGP, don't expect a good result, of course. They are all mutually reinforcing, all extremely important uh, because they are mutually reinforcing. Now, I'll let you judge whether or not we have what is appropriate in terms of uh, completion of the single market and uh, completion, implementation of the structural reform. I would only call for being much more active in these two domains, which again are 
very, very important, very important for the euro area, very important for uh, the, all the members of the European Union and are in the hands of, uh, of the Commission and of the Council. Uh, but again, uh, I think that uh, all those who have an influence uh, should uh, utilize their influence uh, in Europe to make uh, the case for being much more active in those domains, much more effective, because again, we, we need it. We need it for not only for, uh, I would say, reinforcing the euro area, we need it for growth, we need it for job creation, we need it for the full success of uh, our endeavor, both uh, European Union and euro area. Now, I mentioned the crisis, I mentioned the drama of the crisis, uh, as you know, a lot of observers the world over were thinking that uh, we would collapse, we would evaporate, that the euro itself as a currency would evaporate because it was much too bold to create a new currency from scratch. And very numerous were there betting on the explosion or at least the dismantling of the euro area. We went through that stress test. I already said that it was the worst financial crisis since World War II. We could see that the euro was there as a currency and remained credible. Uh, most of the time in the crisis, the main criticism of the euro, very paradoxically, was it is too solid, <laughs> it is too strong, it is too credible a currency. Uh, I let you judge whether this was uh, appropriate uh, uh, judgment, but what is sure is that it meant that that currency was not evaporating and disappearing, which uh, had been at the very beginning uh, of the euro, more or less, the vision of many. And as regards the euro area, it is clear that the euro area, the integrity of the euro area was at stake uh, it is also very clear that in the stress test, the euro area uh, resisted. I would uh, even utilize a Spinozist uh, concept of uh, persevere in the being. And the 15 countries that were in the euro area at the moment of the collapse of Lehman Brothers are still in the euro area, the 15, including Greece, as we all know and four new countries entered in the euro area since Lehman Brothers, four new sovereign countries. In my own country where there are many that are uh, explaining that the euro area is extraordinarily unstable, very weak and so forth, uh, the fact is that four new sovereign countries decided to enter after Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, huh? Slovakia, and the two Baltic states. So that, as already mentioned, we are 19 today when we were 15 at the start of the dramatic episode of the financial crisis. I'll let you judge. It doesn't mean, again, that uh, the success is only to persevere in the being. The success is growth and jobs. And growth and jobs means sound management, structural reforms, completion, of uh, all uh, what we have decided, including the single market. And, and that is absolutely fundamental because we have to elevate the growth potential of Europe and structural reforms are decisive in this respect. Now I conclude, what else? The five uh, presidents have mentioned a number of things to come. I will concentrate myself on two issues that are, again, simplifying and can explain better in the question and answer. I would say what we need now not only, is not only, of course, the full implementation of all what has been decided, and it is very, very important, but also reinforcing the executive branch of the euro area, reinforcing the legislative branch of the euro area. Executive branch in my opinion, we need a Minister of Finance of the Euro Area. I made that proposal uh, in 2011 in the uh, Aachen uh, speech I delivered uh, in Aachen. Uh, and uh, we, we uh, have, in my opinion, need 
to have a person who would synthesize the euro area as the executive of the UA. It could be a vice president of the commission with this particular responsibility of driving the euro area. Uh, I uh, could see that the five presidents are mentioning the fact that a person could be a permanent full-time president of the euro group. Of course, this proposal I made uh, uh, years ago would fit with that uh, person, which I, which I call vice president of the commission, minister of finance of the euro area, which would be full-time uh, to drive the euro area, represent the euro area uh, outside in the international financial institutions, would also take care of uh, implementing SGP, MIP, uh, to the extent that uh, some responsibilities are in the executive branch, uh, hence the uh, banking union or resolution uh, uh, fund uh, union and so forth, and also uh, would have uh, the overall capacity to enter in dialogue with the various countries concerned if we are on the verge of having some kind of uh, uh, excessive deficits procedure or excessive uh, imbalances procedure. And of course, together with this uh, Minister of Finance, you would have a, an administration, a technostructure, uh, say a treasury, if you wish. Second, we would need much more clout for the legislative branch. And my proposal, uh, which uh, today is an original proposition to my knowledge, but I made also years ago, is to ask the European Parliament in the format of the Euro area to have the ultimate say when there is a conflict between a particular country and the European institution say that a country does not live with the recommendation in the case of excessive deficit procedure, excessive imbalances uh, procedure, and challenges the wisdom of the European institution, commission, and council. Then it seems to me we should not embark in a succession, on a succession of uh, happening at the level of the European Council, we should have a full-fledged procedure with all appropriate contact between, uh, I would say, executive branches and also parliaments, but the last word should be given to the European Parliament in the format I have mentioned. It seems to me, and I will conclude of that, it would be effective today when there is such a conflict. It is supposed to be solved by imposition of fines, I don't think, they never function. I don't think that it is an appropriate uh, way of getting out of such a situation. Uh, so it would be effective. It would be fully democratic because it would be the representative of the people of Europe which would have to decide after due contact with the national parliament concerned, but representative of the people, as in all democracy, would have the last word. And it would also respect the subsidiarity principle because it would function only in exceptional cases, only when we are in the very, very extraordinary situation where there is a conflict between a particular country on the wisdom of recommendation or perhaps on the appropriate way of uh, implementing uh, the uh, adjustment program which is financed by the ESM. And uh, we could see that in a recent period. So subsidiarity principle respected, effectiveness respected, and democratic uh, accountability uh, also fully respected. Uh, I had called that in the past, I don't know whether it is an appropriate qualification, some kind of, I would say, economic and budgetary and fiscal federation by exception, because it would be like in a federation, decision by the federal parliament, but by exception, because again, it would function only in exceptional cases. These are the two, uh, I would say, uh, uh, additional um, uh, avenue that I would uh, like to suggest in simplifying and concentrating uh, the, the call. 
Uh, of course, I'm fully aware that it is not necessarily for tomorrow because these are heavy decisions, but I'm sure that we are not at the end of the road in Europe. Even if we have made a lot of progress in the crisis, we still have to be more effective and more democratic. And these are the two ways perhaps I would propose. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Claude. You did not disappoint us um, by making very clear what happened the last few years. Um, I think it's very good to, to remind everybody that Europe was really hit at least by these two crises. First, the global financial crisis triggered in the United States, swept the world, but then as we were coming out of that crisis, there was the euro area sovereign debt crisis, um, competitiveness crisis, the euro crisis in the end. And it was this combination of having two crises within a very short period of time that gave us a result um, that you described, um, the worst economic crisis um, since World War II in, in over 80 years. And also thank you for providing a clear framework, a good structure with the six reasons for the crisis. Um, um, I think that helps us to understand what went wrong, and it's very important to understand what went wrong before one can decide um, whether the right decisions have been taken and what is still missing. I would also agree that we have come a long way. Good progress has been made on these six points that you mentioned. Um, not, of course, 100% in each case, but, but good progress. Um, when I look at it, um, um, the new rules indeed of, on our fiscal framework are now tighter, less room for political interference, that's very important. But as you said, it's now very important to implement these commonly agreed rules in a credible way. Um, competitiveness, current account, that's where we really have seen a lot of um, progress, particularly in the countries that received loans from the EFSF and ESM because they were forced to go through adjustment programs. They had to do what we would now call the internal devaluation, which is very painful. But in the monetary union, the only way to quickly adjust competitiveness um, once it, it gets out of control. Thank you for mentioning EFSF and ESM prominently. Um, banking union, of course, we all agree that this is a very important step. And I remember when um, in the 90s we discussed quite often whether one could also, with the beginning of monetary union, have a European supervision of banks and the financial system. That seemed to, to be impossible. There was no consensus on that. With the crisis, um, that became possible and banking union is very important. Of course, you also rightly mentioned the one element that's missing still, EDIS, European Deposit Insurance Scheme. And you also mentioned the capital markets union that the commission, for good reasons, has on its agenda. And finally, structural reforms, of course, need to always continue in every country. Again, we can see that the countries that had to borrow from the EFSF and ESM, uh, made more progress in that area than, than other countries. And that's, I think, um, should give us confidence that these countries will have a pretty good future um, because they have implemented more reforms than others and therefore that's what economic history tells us. They will grow better than other countries um, in the medium term. So thank you very much for explaining all this very clearly. I'm sure there will be questions about the future. Um, you talked about what is still missing, and um, these are indeed key issues that cannot be done overnight, but it's important to think about it on the um, executive branch and on the legislative branch, um, democratic accountability. Um, I will leave it to the audience to ask more questions on that. 
I would have one that is related, but you didn't mention it. Um, there's a debate also whether um, the euro area should have its own budget, euro area budget, um, separate from the EU, or some people call it a limited fiscal capacity. Um, others, um, like one prominent minister in your country says, the euro area needs substantial additional transfers. Um, others say fiscal capacity could only be activated maybe if a country is hit by asthmatic shocks. So there's a debate out there on this fiscal, in this fiscal area with quite different views. Um, some are very limited, others are quite substantive. So I would be interested to hear from you what you think is really needed to make uh, monetary union more robust from that side. Thank you, thank you, Klaus, for uh, <coughs> this question. And uh, I'm very happy that we we are in good uh, understanding on, on many other things. I did not mention it because I wanted to concentrate on the two uh, main proposals I made. I have to say that I am a little bit cautious as regards uh, some of the uh, proposal. One proposal is let's have a full transfer union. And I have to say I'm not convinced that this would be uh, appropriate and uh, that it would be sellable. If I don't see how you can sell to countries that are behaving as properly as possible, that on top of being sound and reasonable themselves, they would have to finance permanently other countries. Uh, it, it is something which comes very frequently, I have to say also out of Europe. Uh, it's, it's a recommendation that we hear out of Europe and it, it doesn't seem to me that it is something which is really workable. We, we must have help given by the European Union, which is the case uh, with a number of uh, exceptional financing for the regional financing or for structural financing. We, we, one, one can imagine, I would say, eligibility to some financing. But the idea that you must have a budget which would, which would permit to permanently finance some countries uh, with the money of others seems to me not appropriate. By the way, I the five presidents are saying something which I found certainly wise. They say in this new capacity we imagine and we call for a group, uh, uh, the travail, a working party to go on it, we wouldn't suggest that there is a permanent transfer. We would not suggest that. What they are more or less suggesting would be, if I understand well, something like a stabilization fund or a stabilization budget that could function uh, to amortize the cycle at the level of Europe as a whole or the euro area as a whole. That is not necessarily a bad idea and I would fully accept that we, we reflect on that and work of, on that. It's true that uh, uh, that might be helpful, but on the ground that it would not function only on the spending direction. It should also be able to accumulate fund in the affluent period in order to be a real, I would say, amortization of the cycle and not an additional way uh, necessarily, an additional way of spending. So it's, it's a delicate point. I, I think that uh, uh, we are going uh, towards a union which would be closer and closer, that's my understanding. And of course, at a certain moment, we could have the start of a budget at the level of uh, the EU area itself. Uh, provided, again, it is not only uh, a way of organizing permanent transfer, but it would you know, be justified or fully justified. Uh, maybe because I am prudent and cautious and I don't see necessarily a lot of political will in this direction, I don't consider that it should be on top of the call and I could see also that the five president and the commission and the president of the, of the uh, uh, council are not making that proposal on top of their own file. 
Yes, thank you very much. And again, as often, I would agree with you, um, not only because it's not sellable, I think, you're absolutely right, um, the stronger countries would not accept that, but I think it's also not, not necessary when we think what is really needed to make monetary union more robust. The fact that countries with very different um, income levels have the same currency is not a problem per se. If um, income developments go up in, and converge in line with productivity developments, then there is no problem at all. But one could think about stabilization mechanisms where compared to the US, I think we are underdeveloped and rainy day funds, as some have called it, might, might be one option. Let's invite the audience. Um, I'm sure with so many people here, um, there are questions. Here was a very quick arm up. And um, with these uh, negative interest rates, which may stay for a while, as it seems, what do you think might be the implication on bank balance sheets? And if you look in the medium term, also on the stability of the financial system then? Very good question, of course. Uh, several comments. Uh, first comment. All what the central banks are doing uh, in the advanced economy, in Switzerland, in the US, in Japan, in Europe, and not only in the euro area, but also in Denmark or uh, in Sweden, are extraordinary things. And my interpretation, because I observe that in all advanced economy, is that we have a spontaneous functioning of the advanced economy, which is still extraordinarily abnormal. Uh, I will mention the dramatic financial crisis, the most dramatic since perhaps uh, 29, or even before, <laughs> since uh, World War I, if I may. So we, we really are in a situation which we have to fully understand is extraordinarily uh, aberrant. And the fact that countries and uh, central banks, which have a fantastic reputation for being wise and sound and reasonable over time, like the Swiss central bank, are also those who have embarked uh, that resolutely in extraordinary augmentation of the size of their balance sheet and extraordinary low uh, negative interest rates is telling something. So, first comment, the job has to be done by our governments and our parliaments and our society as a whole in the advanced economy. The problem is there. The problem is not the decision of the central banks, at least in my own understanding of the situation. That being said, of course, the central banks are doing things that I think are justified but have consequences that are unintended and very bad, and that's obvious. Uh, so again, it gives additional ground to tell the other partners that they have to do their job. And that the fact that they don't do their job is more or less obliging uh, a number of institutions that again, have a reputation for, uh, for being wise and reasonable to do things that uh, are obviously uh, with some unintended consequences. It is obviously the case of the negative rates, you're, you're right. Uh, it's also the case of uh, you know, the quantitative uh, uh, intervention that uh, are observed or have been observed uh, in all advanced economies. It is also the case of uh, other extraordinary uh, decision that uh, have been taken, including the uh, off-balance sheet uh, action, particularly important in Europe, I have to say, because when we, we started with full allotment at fixed rate, full allotment at fixed rate, uh, at various uh, duration, we started with, uh, with uh, three months, six months, then one year, three years. All this is an off-balance sheet commitment 
of first magnitude because the old commercial banks can draw all what they, they would prefer to draw. And we could see at some times, in my time, uh, it was up to uh, uh, 500 billion, if, I, if my memory is exact. And uh, with my successor, it, it was even more. But uh, in, in any case, it is an off balance sheet commitment. So again, let's do all what we can to have the correction of the abnormal functioning of our own economies. And uh, from that standpoint, I think that, I think that the euro area is doing all what it can. And as you know, uh, the recommendation which were made by the central banks to, to, I would say, back the commission and the recommendation of the commission or to back the council or to back the ESM, uh, we, we, we shared diagnosis in all cases. I have no memory of uh, difference of views. But for, for the ECB, it goes quite far because, because we, we, uh, the treaty doesn't say you should permanently tell governments and p that they are not behaving extremely properly. And <laughs> it is what we have been doing because, again, we thought that it was necessary. Thank you. So this question went far beyond the euro area because I think Jean-Claude is right to point out that what the ECB does um, compared to what other central banks around the world have been doing for longer um, is not truly really extraordinary. Who is next? There was something over there, please. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, the third pillar of the banking union that is proposed by the Commission now. Um, what do you think about a risk weight for sovereign debt for banks? This is a, a very important question. I think we have to rely upon the Basel Committee for that and the overall consensus at the level of the uh, international community. Uh, the idea uh, that uh, in uh, the present circumstances, uh, sovereign risk have to be uh, considered uh, without risk uh, is a generalized position uh, in the international community. Uh, I already said myself that it was not necessarily the vision of the investors and savers that have a tendency to consider that uh, you have to judge any signature according to its own merit, to its own, uh, I would say, uh, uh, capacity to, uh, to prove and demonstrate that it is creditworthy. Uh, I will, on, on the particular case of Europe, I will not, uh, I would say, say uh, how I see things. I know that there is a, a dispute. We are in a situation which is very special uh, we are still in a situation where you have um, some that are wrongly, in my opinion, betting on difficulties in Europe. They are wrong, in my opinion, because we have done a lot of uh, hard work and the ESM knows what kind of hard work has been done. Also because we have proved that, that we were able to sustain uh, very, very harsh and tough environment and uh, as I said uh, not only resist but also expand in such circumstances and so I would my, my advice would be don't don't do things that would in the eyes of the external investors and savers weaken the overall system of the uh, uh, euro area that being said there is now a supervisor that supervisor is uh, very close to the ECB, and I would ask the supervisor to do all what is necessary uh, without necessarily changing the uh, rules that are applied, but to be sure that you know, the various institutions concerned and the various banks concerned are, are solid. And it is uh, what uh, the ECB does in the present period, as far as I see it, so I would have confidence. Thank you very much. Um, and I think as a minimum, if something were to change in that area, long transition periods would be needed. There was another question on that side. No. 
I don't really see way up because there's too much light against us. Any questions anywhere there? Wolf? Just very briefly, thank you very much in, uh, for the, this very insightful um, recapitulation of the history and of the lessons for the future. One point that would interest me since you experienced all that crisis and that has actually changed um, till now is in the creation of the banking union that you very much commended and that I also agree is very necessary. There was also a paradigm shift from bail in, uh, from, from the bailout to bail in. Uh, of the banking system as one of the pillars of the linking the sovereign and the banks. I would just like to hear your account, your personal account, how you see that development and to see that as a pillar going forward. Well, this, this is the uh, very, very important, uh, uh, I would say, choice that we, we had to, to make in the crisis in the, around, uh, I would say, Basel and all the institution in Basel, namely the, the Basel Committee, but also the GHOS, the Governance and Head of Supervision uh, group that I chaired myself, uh, and, uh, and of course uh, with the report to the uh, Financial Stability Board and, and the G20. We clearly, at a certain moment, as I said, the problem was to arrest the tsunami. So to say, which was promised, again, as a, a very, very large political uh, commitment, uh, there will not be any new uh, Lehman Brothers in my courtyard, which meant, if need be, I will nationalize Bank X and Bank Y. And it is what we have observed through various means, including in the UK, in continental Europe, and of course in the US when they arrested the tsunami with the top and with, the, with the AIG. Now, of course, the objective was we will make the system much more resilient. We will make the individual institution under very strict regulation. We will augment considerably the capital requirement, the liquidity uh, ratio, and so forth and so forth, in order to be reasonably sure that for individual uh, reasons uh, linked to the prudentials, the individual prudentials, and to the systemic uh, reinforcement of the system, we will be able to see a Lehman Brothers collapse or even, I would say, a city collapse or an AIG collapse without having a drama of the type that we had, unfortunately, in 08, 09. And all, all our reasoning at the global level was that one, you know. Let's put ourselves in a universe where we have sufficiently reinforced the system that we can weather quietly such bankruptcies. Exactly uh, according to what I, I was saying was the rhetoric of the US authorities immediately after Lehman Brothers. It proved uh, a rhetoric which was not in line with what, has, what was happening, but should be in line in the future. And uh, of course, Europe is doing exactly the same. I mean, at, at the level of Europe, uh, we are implementing uh, this, this idea that uh, the, the bailout must be replaced by the bail-in, or uh, possibly that much worse than the bail-in, I mean, the, the bankruptcy of, the, of, of that particular institution with, uh, apart from the deposits which are guaranteed, all others uh, losing their money. So uh, it seems to me that this conceptually is good. We should aim at uh, going there. Of course, there is also there, uh, Klaus, a, a transition because, because it's, it's a, <laughs> a big shift from a situation where you're called by the heads themselves. You can have confidence uh, we will take care of a uh, possible solvability issue when the central banks were caring for the liquidity issues, but not the solvability issue. And now we are uh, in a totally different universe and will be in a totally different universe. So 
I, I, we will see. I mean, my, my own understanding is that it's not obvious that the system, as a system, is much more solid today than it was in the past. What I fear the most are the uh, correlation between the behavior of, uh, I would say, all market participants, uh, investors and savers that uh, we see in these ups and downs, this extraordinary volatility that uh, we are observing in the present period. This volatility, you can explain that. I mean, the, the fall in Wall Street of eight, nine, or 10% in half an hour because we have news coming from here or there, China, or what, you name it, is something which proves that we have a system which is much too volatile. And it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit frightening. So again, we have to remain cautious and prudent. But to the, the idea that uh, Bellingham is now part of our concept is clearly there. There is a consensus for that. And we have to be sure that we live comfortably in this new universe. Thank you. We have time for one or two more questions. Um, up here and then here. Uh, hi. Um, coming back to the banks, uh, don't you think uh, with the negative deposit rates, uh, increasing regulation capital ratios, that they are a little bit squeezed um, between those two and that probably could create some problems, you know, not, not transmitting the credit to the real economy and destroying, again, all the QE effect? No, it's a, it's a very important issue. I, rem I uh, al uh, already uh, mentioned the reflection, the meditation in the Basel Committee in the GHOS. It was also uh, part of our meditation. Uh, not only be sure that we can have uh, bankruptcies in the future and uh, bailing in, but also uh, let's not reinforce all the prudentials so rapidly that we would block the financing of our economies. And uh, one of the idea we had in mind was let's stagger the uh, uh, overall requirements and the capital requirements in particular so that it will go uh, progressively and we will not insult the recovery of the second half of, uh, of uh, 2009 and uh, 10, 11 and so forth. The fact is that the market did not follow us fully, I mean, follow the uh, regulators and the uh, public authorities. The market had a tendency to say, well, if you ask the banks to be in that position in terms of capital requirement in 2018, we will ask this requirement to be implemented immediately. And uh, we, we were all the observers of a, a very, very powerful market reaction, which was calling for accelerating all the requirements that, again, were in the first intention of the uh, authorities uh, staggered over a relatively, uh, I would say, long period of time. So I, I agree with you. I mean, we, we were in an abominable crisis. The idea that uh, we would be culprit if we would not uh, diminish considerably the risk of being again in this abominable crisis uh, was present in all our minds. The fact is that we were not sure, and I'm not sure, that if we would mean today to do to help the system not falling down. The same kind of commitment at the level of the uh, governments and parliaments, say at the, at the political level, if we had to ask them to do exactly the same as they did in 08 or 09, I'm not sure that they would have the political capacity to do it. And in case they have not the political capacity to do it, then the Great Depression would be sure. You know, it's a very, very delicate point. When I look at the uh, hearings in the uh, 
on the other side of the Atlantic. And the still very strong criticism which are uh, uh, expressed against the decisions that were taken at the heat of the crisis, uh, I see uh, the real difficulty that our democracies might have. And what is true on the other side of the Atlantic is of course true uh, on, on our side of the Atlantic. So again, uh, I think what we try to have is the appropriate compromise between the absolute necessity to foster the, the, the recovery and uh, to, to get the growth and jobs which are uh, so necessary and the idea of not uh, having a new catastrophe that would even be more costly in terms of course of growth and jobs and it's difficult one of the difficulty which is a, a, a european difficulty is that uh, our financing goes through banks massively in the us the financing goes through markets massively the uh, you know, before the crisis, it was more or less 2080, 2080, 20% 20 for the markets in Europe and 80% for the banks, for the overall financing of the economy, and the reverse in the US, 80% for the markets and 20% for the banks. And of course, that does not help Europe because we are very much concentrating on banks and on capital requirements, uh, liquidity ratio, and so forth. And so we are touching a, a very large part of the financing of our economy, when in the US it's a smaller part of the financing of the economy which is judged. And it's an additional reason for going in the direction of the capital market uh, union, because, because uh, we, we, we need to, to rely a little bit more on markets. There is also an observation which I was myself uh, uh, considering, and which is, uh, close to uh, some kind of uh, political economy. If you rescue a bank, you rescue an institution, you rescue people, you know, the, the, the members of, the, of that bank, you rescue possibly uh, identified, uh, I would say, uh, creditors, uh, you rescue a lot of, and it is, of course, in the case it is a, a, a bailout, you rescue with public money. If you intervene massively on a market, it is much more, uh, you know, disseminated. You, you don't know exactly, uh, you, there is no particular institution. There is no, I mean, it's disseminated. And it seems that in our democracies, it's more accepted to uh, avoid the illiquidity of markets and to intervene massively on markets, it's more accepted than to intervene massively on individual institutions that you can see and touch. I draw your attention to that. It is something which surprised me, but uh, might also be something to, to consider in a, I would say, long-term structural vision. It's, it might be an additional reason for having more market financing in Europe, uh, not necessarily emulating the US, but, but uh, changing a little bit the structure of financing of our economy. I think that's again right, and I think the many bankers in the room can confirm that they are not very popular at the moment. Um, anybody in the back? Then... Yeah, please. Thank you very much, Peter Koch. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Trichet. It was extremely interesting, your analysis and your, your uh, suggestions for the future. Um, could I pose a question on the lessons from this crisis, as, it's, as I can read there on the wall? Uh, your point three, having no instruments available, which you uh, explained to us very clearly. Um, isn't there a relation between the two? Didn't we need a crisis of this kind? I know it's very dangerous to say so, but you said it was a very, it's an extraordinary crisis, of course. Uh, the instruments which we have defined now, could they have been defined without having such a crisis? Experience has demonstrated that uh, the, it's true that the only real 
uh, quid pro quo for not, not having a political federation and a federal budget was the Stability and Growth Pact, ex ante. The idea of uh, monitoring competitiveness, or of having some kind of you know, overall central monitoring of the uh, uh, evolution of unit labor cost and so forth, was not considered fully in line with uh, the normal behavior of a market economy. We proved wrong on that. That's absolutely clear. As Klaus already said, the idea of having a centralized supervision, banking supervision or financial supervision was also envisaged but appeared to be totally out of scope. And of course, <laughs> the ESM <laughs> would appear totally out of scope. Uh, we, we were conceptually in a universe where wrongly we thought that big crises were not likely at all. Uh, the idea was uh, if uh, you behave improperly, you will be punished because your spreads will augment. The idea that not only the spreads could augment on your treasury, but that you could have to deal with a sudden stop was not an idea which was natural at all also. So experience clearly demonstrates that Jean Monnet is absolutely right, was absolutely right when he said it is in the period of crisis that we can you know, make advances. Uh, and clearly, without the crisis, at the moment I'm speaking, we would not have the MIP, we would not have the ESM, we would not have the banking union, and perhaps we would continue to be quite loose on the SGP, uh, as uh, you know, has been demonstrated. What would have happened exactly had we not had a financial crisis in Wall Street? In my opinion, we would have a wake-up call in Europe. That's absolutely sure. But perhaps much later on. And it would have been a pity, obviously, because, because it was urgent to introduce the new instruments, the new tools, and to be fully aware of what is necessary in a single currency. Let, let me go back to the MIP. The MIP is absolutely decisive. I will give you the figures of the augmentation of wages and salaries in the public sector, in the civil service, from the start of the euro up to end of 09. First January 99, December 09. Start of the sovereign risk crisis. In the following countries, Greece, augmentation in euro plus 120%. Ireland, augmentation in euro, 117%. Portugal, approximately 85%, plus 85%. Spain, approximately plus 65%. The four countries you mentioned, Klaus, in that order. And they came, became in that order clients of the EMSF and the ESF. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, average 36, Germany 20, 20, 36, 65, 75, uh, 117, 120. The same currency, same international purchasing power, same international cost. And why do I mention the civil service? Because if I would ma have mentioned other indicators, the ministers of finance would have tell, told me, look, uh, we are not responsible for the market economy functioning. These are the social partners. These are the, the entrepreneurs and so forth. So mentioning <laughs> the civil service decision, I could say it is your decision. You have yourself participated actively in these persistent divergences which are so extraordinary. So now we know that we can, in a single currency area, have behaviors that are absolutely aberrant 
if you take into account the fact that it is the same currency. It is the same currency. And of course, in each particular country, it's less visible because you have not only your own cost, but also your own prices. And of course, the prices go, go up also domestically. And you have your own national inflation, or your own, you know, everything is augmenting more or less homothetically. And you don't realize that you are simply losing your competitiveness. As simple as that, of course, because all your prices are uh, not competitive, uh, and uh, it's true for uh, goods, services, and uh, everything. So we we have to be fully aware of that. And I have to say that the five presidents have recommended the creation of a competitiveness council in each country for not only the monitoring of the MIP being done at the level of the center, which is absolutely necessary, but also to be better understood at the level of the various nation concerned. And I'm afraid that this recommendation is not very popular, neither in many countries, nor uh, even in countries that are very sound and reasonable, nor amongst the so social partners still by whatever mean, we need a full understanding by our public opinion that the key for uh, being you know, uh, prosperous and uh, eliminating mass unemployment is to have the appropriate level of competitiveness and not losing competitiveness. Uh, one point of uh, unit labor cost more than the average means more unemployment. That's absolutely clear. So you have to oscillate around the average uh, if uh, you want to be uh, reasonably uh, you know, well positioned in terms of, uh, of uh, competitiveness and therefore growth and jobs. Thank you very much, Jean-Claude. I think we have to draw this to a close. Um, thank you very much for coming to Luxembourg, for giving this very clear explanation about the crisis, what went wrong, um, what has happened, and I think we share the view that a lot has happened these last few years and probably more or certainly more than would have happened without a crisis. But you were also very clear that there are remaining issues that need to be tackled on top of using the new procedures and agreements in a credible way. So thank you very much for that and thank you all for coming and joining this debate. <laughs>